Um, if you look at our global portfolio of about 100 plus billion, about 70% is credit from investment grade, high yield, private placements, more recently this private debt, uh, as well as transitional real estate, commercial mortgage loans. Uh, we, we have an allocation to infrastructure. So credit is what we're looking for. Uh, in the IG space, that's ALM purposes, very steady credit, but uh, we don't need liquidity. Aflac's insurance policies, disability, cancer insurance, our actuaries know how that's gonna pay off, so we don't have to worry about daily liquidity, so we wanna take advantage of that. Uh, but something that's unique to us, as I mentioned earlier, 85% uh, of my balance sheet resides in Japan. So the other 30% is in Japan government bonds. Um, not unusual if you compared us to other Japanese insurers, because, yeah, the, Japan doesn't have a bond market other than JGBs. There's, there's a small credit market, but very tiny as compared to ours. But we need those JGBs for ALM purposes. All of our liabilities in Japan are in yen. So when you think about economic capital, managing interest rate risk, um, you know, uh, the duration of the liabilities, et cetera, we need that. But if you look at, at a typical U.S. life insurer, and uh, the other assets for Aflac are our U.S. business, it's 95% uh, credit and, and di those different flavors that I just mentioned. We wouldn't hold a lot of treasury securities, and most U.S. life insurers wouldn't, but Japan is a bit unique. Uh, I can... don't mind my staying with Eric because it, was, it is kind of unusual to have somebody uh, talk about long-term liabilities with 80% of it coming from another a foreign country, albeit more stable than many. I was wondering if you have to manage your FX risk and if it's in den denominated in yen. I mean, I've done some fixed income myself. Great, and great question. Yeah. So. Uh, terrific, terrific question. We do actually, on behalf of Aflac Japan, that balance sheet, have a foreign program. It's mostly a dollar program because we do look at that portfolio globally. So we have about a $25 billion allocation to dollar assets, which a variety of those assets I just mentioned, but we hedge most of it back to yen. Uh, and we have a hedging program for that. Uh, but that's also a good tie-in to why we like the middle market loan space as well as what we call transitional real estate. I put that in the private debt as well. Those assets are floating rate. So besides the credit underwriting we're able to do and to earn that attractive return, the coupons are floating off of LIBOR. That's a high correlation to our hedge costs because hmm. we're using shorter dated hedges. We don't want to use longer term hedges. So by matching those two up, we're taking some of the risk out of those rising hedge costs. And keep in mind, as an insurance company, every asset we buy rolls up into US GAAP into a US public company called Aflac. So we create three billion of income. So uh, when those hedge costs are doing this, as they've done the last two years, not unexpected, that actually reduces our net investment income. So we have to find assets that will outperform the hedging costs, but when we can find assets that match them well, so if hedging costs are going up, our floating rate assets would go up in their coupons. Uh, that's a very good match for us and another reason why we like this asset class. Could I, could I maybe chime in on, on uh, 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 the question about data science and, and, and credit. Um, I think you bring up an interesting question there. Uh, certainly, w what I've seen with, with managers, um, data used in the equity, equity investing space is widely used, quantum mental type strategies. You see it all the time. I think on the credit side, I also see a lot of data used in structure credit, kind of uh, uh, asset-backed securities, things of that nature. Don't really see it in, in the corporate credit space in terms of the, 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 maybe the, it seems like more traditional roll up your sleeves credit analysis, but um, maybe that's a function of trading costs and, and slippage there, but, uh, but maybe over time we'll, we'll see more of that kind of quantum mental approach. Okay, Cargo, I think we agree. Um, I guess in one statement, we're almost going opposite machine learning side and focus maybe on uh, can we find opportunities in process risk or legal risk, right? If, um, so you, there's like litigation financing or um, uh, federal claims in South, South American countries type things where a lot of the roll up your sleeve, make sure every page is there, read every document type approach, which 
I don't know, maybe, maybe machines can, can learn to do that. I don't know, yeah, but so. I, I, I would just add, I, to your point, I think the role of the traditional credit analyst hasn't changed up and down the stack. But I have to believe big data will play a part in assisting the credit analyst. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to mm -hmm. replace the credit analyst, but maybe a credit analyst is looking at a specific industry. Use retail, for example. How could big data not play a part in analyzing trends, sales trends, that makes you a better credit analyst? Um, I haven't quite seen anything yet really approach us, but I can't imagine it's not going to.